I believe that Dr. King was here today, and if you can see, you can probably say something like this. From my side, this battle looks lost. Constantly falling beneath my cross. Now I fall the good fight again till I was told this battle is not yours. God is still in control. I had to learn to let him fight in my place. He didn't slow me down. He quickened my pace, and for that I won't walk, I will still strive. In his word I will abide, I will think I will stand strong, even if I stand alone. And if someday I may fall, I'll just look back and recall when I was done in this fight. Jesus led me to the light. Help me up. I won't walk. I will still strive. In His word, I will stand. I won't break. I will stand strong. In His word, I will stand. And if someday I may fall, I'll just look back and recall when I was done in this fight. My God led me to the light. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. It's truly a, a privilege and a pleasure to be here. I know this is a moment of destiny. I know this is a moment of destiny for many reasons. And one of those reasons is because when I got the email inviting me to this occasion, I was actually standing in the Atlanta airport. And I got an email from a young lady by the name of Amber, who I would like to acknowledge at this time. I want to give you a gift, Amber. We come forward. Give our hand. This is a book project that my wife and I co-wrote together. It's actually my wife's story. It was so amazing, her story. But I want to acknowledge Amber. She gave me a wonderful tour today, and I want to thank her for her leadership. And I also want to acknowledge Kyle, my other tour guide. Kyle, where are you? Come on out. This book is called Twelve Shades of Man. It's got, a book, uh, got authors like Eric Thomas and other great speakers in it. I have a chapter in there, and hopefully you encourage it. Thank you. And then I have a, a prize for someone who is brave enough to raise their hand and to take a guess. Someone's going to raise their hand. Yeah, yeah. raise their hand. You are brave enough to raise your hand. But I want to ask you a question. I, I, I know I've said a few words and trying to figure out my accent with some of you. And so I need you to raise your hand and take a guess where I am from. If you can guess. It's another age right here. Yeah, come on, you raise your hand for a second. You can do it. Not Canada, but because you're so brave, I'm going to give you the t shirt anyway. Fishing, choose a so amazing life. You're so amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I, I'm actually from the island of Bermuda. So, um, how many of you have heard of Bermuda before? All right. I love it. I, mean, I, I say I should know that. Right? We don't know everything. I love it. Beautiful. Uh, so let me just teach you one or two words. I don't know another language. My accent's a little different. So can you just make me feel that her real quick? Can you say her? But we're going to be saying her, right? And you don't say, oh, right? We're going to be saying her. Uh, we also say something like, uh, I'm going to go down the road. Can you say down the road? Down the road. Down the road. All right, you're going to be now. You're going to be here now. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> An interesting 
thing about, about getting the, the, the invitation from Amber, you know, I was standing, as I mentioned, in the Atlantic Airport. And I've been to that airport many times. And every time I go to that airport, there's a particular location that I go to. There is a, a, a memorial for Dr. King in the airport. And so I got the, e the email, and but as I was standing at that memorial, I was reflecting. I was, you know, I was looking at his coat. You know, the first time I saw it, I, I didn't realize that he was, he was pretty slender. Just looking at his stature, I, I took a look at some of the books that he had read, and I looked at the margins where he had written in the margins of the books. I, I took a look at the glasses that, they, that he had in there that he, he, he used to wear because he said it, it made him feel or look intelligent. Yeah, Dr. King, you know, he sort of, you know, he was just. You know, you sort of, you know, just didn't mind putting on your glasses and just to do it just for a little style, right? I, I, I've become a student of, of Dr. King. I, I've, I've been following him. I've been reading a lot of his material. And, you know, if, if I didn't have uh, the opportunity to, to stand at that airport and reflect, I, I, I would also listen to his speech in our car. My six-year-old son, we would go back and forth and try to do our best King invitations, you know. So, you know, five, four years ago. <laughs> The great American in whose symbolic statue we shall stand. Right? And we'll go back and forth trying to, to emulate his words and try to connect with him, try to reconnect, if you will, with, with, with his dream. I've been following, I've been reading, I've been looking at his life and reading his speeches. I recently had the opportunity to travel to Montgomery, Alabama. And it's interesting because, you know, as, you, as I walked Montgomery, I realized just the proximity of Dr. King to many of the different issues that he was facing. Like I stood at Dexter Avenue and his church was right there where he was the pastor. And just a, a few stone, a stone throw away was the, the governor's office, the capital, if you will, where, 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 where he was you know, going back and forth with this individual, yet he was so close to him. I was amazed by how you, know, you could look at, at, at the streets and you could see places where Rosa Parks decided to get on the bus and refused to move. I, I, was, I was just looking at the signs of the Freedom Riders and I was, just blown away by the reality of being in that space. You know, it's one thing to talk about a dream. It's, it's one thing to, to listen to the speeches. It's, it's one thing to, 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 to hear about Dr. King, but it's another thing to begin to walk where he walked, to begin to think about the things that he, think, he thought about, to begin to reflect on the realities that he had to reflect. And what I've come to realize is that, you see, many of you are looking at me a little bit differently because I believe that there's a bit of a generational disconnect with Dr. King, and that's why I'm here today. Some of you heard the name, you heard the speech, or the, 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 the I have a dream speech, but there's a whole lot about it that we don't really get. And I've realized that, that, that in this generation, you know, there's a need for us to reconnect with the dream and to put, connect across generations. And so, you know, forgive me if I'm real passionate, because yesterday I wasn't in an environment like this. Yesterday, about this time, I was preparing to funeralize a 17-year-old 17 17 young man, probably about the same age of some of you, of you in this room. I heard his mother's cry. I saw his friends walk into that particular church, and it was a different preparation than it was for today, Dr. Coleman. It was different. But it gave me an urgency to talk to us in this room because we have privilege and we have opportunities and we have some, 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 some realities that we need to face. And I, I realized even as I asked them, I said, listen, how many of you all have seen the film Selma? And most of them didn't raise their hand. And I just asked the question, hey, how many of you have seen the film Selma? Not many. I would encourage you to take a, take a look at it. There's this generational disconnect with Dr. King. And the interesting thing is, I actually met the young man, check this out, I'm talking about connecting research and practice. I actually met this young man while engaged in a lot of community work that I do at a particular park called Douglas Park. And it's here that I, I had the opportunity to build a relationship with him. See, I've come to the conclusion, I don't just do research. Life is too short, there's so many people that have heard it. I can't just do research, I do my own research. I look at myself, I, say, I begin to ask questions of, of myself, like why am I here? Why is Ty Douglas here? Why are you alive? How, how is it that you were able to navigate some of the dynamics that some people in your neighborhood did? Why are you here? I'm not much better, I'm no, no better than that. But if I look at the process, if I look at some of the experiences that I've had, the institutions that I've been able to attend, I'll realize that there was some infrastructure that I had that some of them didn't. And so I had to ask myself, you know, why am I here? That, that's, that's the me search. And then from research, I then move to what I call research. How do I take what I've experienced, Kyle? I'm here. I, I, I had an opportunity to, to, 
navigate some stuff that others haven't. So that how do I shift systems? How do I challenge institutions so that more people can have the similar experience that I had? And I realized, guys, that there's a disconnect, unfortunately, for our generation, because we're not quite sure how the dream connects to us. I was at a college campus, and I saw a picture. It was a picture of uh, uh, Dr. King and a silhouette of President Obama. It was actually not present at the time. It was around 2008. And I believe it was at HBCU, and it was a, a student effort to sort of capture the significance of the moment. And so the, the, the picture said, I have a dream next to Dr. King. And then next to President Obama, they sat to Obama and said, I am the dream. And I thought, OK, I get it. But I also thought, uh oh, because we get into a dangerous situation where we begin to believe that the dream is just about one person. And what's happened is that we've gone to the place where we think the dream was just about Dr. King. If you begin to start the civil rights movement, there were many other individuals who were significant in that. He was maybe the spokesperson, but we had a lot of people like uh, Abernathy and, and other individuals who were significant. Dr. Uh, Rosa Parks was a tired black woman who didn't want to get up. She was a, a movement shaker in the movement. And so I've come to realize that many of us, even we thought that President Obama is, is a manifestation of the completion of the dream, and we were post-racial now. That's not accurate. We need to understand that this is about a movement, not just about one person. And so today, in the short time I have left, I promise you I will keep you long. I want us to really take some time to reevaluate the process. I want us to, to ask some questions. You know, I've always been one who asks questions. And I'm at an institution here with future scientists. I don't want to say future scientists. I want this building. You're all scientists now. You're mathematicians now. Love it. And so you're all about process. You know, I remember mathematics, and math is one of the subjects where you can. You can get the answer wrong, but you may still get points for having the process right. Do you all still do that? Do they do that here? I know this is a, right? This is about the process, right? <laughs> I tell my students that the, that the process, the process is more important than the product, that the process is the product. Because if your process is right, eventually you'll get the product right. And so I want to take some time today, real quick, to get you to think about your process. I want you to reflect on where you are in your journey. I want you to reflect on why you're here. I want you to ask some questions. You know, if Dr. King was here at IMSA, what would he be in the cafeteria? What would he be like in the cafeteria? What would he be like in your class as a classroom? If he was your social type of teacher, what was what his lesson today look like? The principal or leader, what, how would he lead? I ask questions because that's what I was inspired to do in elementary school. You know, I was the young person who always had a question. I was a young person who always had something to say. Can you tell? <laughs> and it's so cool because now I get paid to research. I always ask questions and to talk. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I've come to find that a lot of what we've been called to do, we've actually already done it on a smaller level at a younger, at a, at a younger age. So some of you are trying to figure out, like, what am I supposed to be doing? Where, where, what am I supposed to I know I'm doing science and math, but how does it connect to a larger journey, to a larger destiny? I want you to take a look at where you've been. Much of what you're called to do on a global level, you've already done on a local level. So singing, songwriting, you know, writing, speaking, those are things that I did on a local level. And so now I can do it on an international level. But I need you to think about your process, because that's the reality, that you need to look back and see where you're going and where you've been. That, you know, a lot of research suggests that in order for you to be an expert at something, you need to put in 10,000 hours before the age of 18. And so by second grade, I put, put in $10,000 in talking. <laughs> my elementary school teacher, I remember, I, you know, her name was Miss Furman. And I had a crush on her, okay, I just admit, I had a crush on Miss Furman. <laughs> she was a new teacher. You know, she was shocked, she was a new teacher. And on this particular day, you know, I, I remember I was, I was you know, in class, and I was talking to my just per usual. And she, she called me up. She said, you know, she called me up, she said, you know, I'm going to stop talking. Now, I had a crush on her, but I still decided that you know, I, I had a reputation to protect. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I stood to my feet with my, my blazer, you know, we were a bit British, so I had my blazer on, like Rose majestically. And I said, Miss Furman, I think you're being facetious. <laughs> I'm six years old. <laughs> so I, I'm a teacher, I'm a teacher, so I know that there's a feeling that you get, like when your student is really getting on your nerves. <laughs> I saw this look in her eyes, I know that no pressing now. <laughs> But she was a wise educator. Freshman teacher, but she was wise. She didn't crush my spirit. She said, 
Do you know what that means? I said, glad you asked. <laughs> I said, trying to be funny, but really not respecting others. She was impressed. So was I, I impressed. <laughs> then she said, what's well, spell it for me? Glad you asked again. <laughs> I said, F-A-C-E-T-I-O-U-S. She was blown away. I had learned that word. My mom had bought this word every day, bought 365 words for the year. And I had learned a word. How many words do you think I learned? <laughs> Facetious. <laughs> but I knew how to use it and use it in context. And I realized in that moment that one, if I knew the meaning of words and they use language effectively, it would get me out of trouble once. Right? It would get me helping to impress somebody that I was interested in. You know what I mean? Right? But, but I also learned there was power in language. And so I was encouraged to ask why. I was the kid in elementary school. I asked my science teacher, it was like maybe fourth grade. And I, you know, all due respect to my science teacher, she was the uh, IMSA teacher. So she wasn't ready for my question. But my question was, I said, listen, you know, um, you know, when planes fly through the clouds, how can they come out the other side of it? Now, you guys have probably already answered that, right? That was probably like an entrance question to get into IMSA, right? You guys got <laughs> Somebody explain it to me later. But I, I mean, she was blown away. But I was just encouraged to ask questions. I was an athlete in elementary school. And so I was getting affirmed. I remember this purpose. She told me I was likable and capable. That meant a lot as a young, dark skinned young man. You know, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys know different actors, but you know, this is before Morris Chestnut and Ted Diggs and the boys. You know, those are like, you know, dark skinned guys that are considered good looking. Back in the day, you know, if you, you had to be what they call light skinned and pretty here. And sort of this mindset that's a reflection of slavery and a mindset that would suggest that the closer you are, the lighter you are, then the more attractive you are. Those problematic dynamics that exist today. So when Ms. Perkins said to me, you were likable and capable, that meant a lot to me. But my high school experience wasn't quite like that. My high school was a good school, a very good school. In fact, it was, I would say that, 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 that IMSA is my high school in steroids. Like you guys are on another level. As far as just like these, you took them to an amazing institution. My institution was very good, excellent, excellent school. But high school was a, it was a challenge for me. I transitioned into this larger environment. This is why I need your attention. I need your attention right now. All eyes on me. I need you. Because I know what it's like to be in a big environment like this. I know what it's like to be around very intelligent people. I work with them every single day. I know what it's like to, 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 to take many different languages and to, to want to be a, a scientist. In fact, when I was your age, I wanted to be a, 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 a uh, I went to be an astronaut, I went to, you know, so I had a telescope and I took, I remember taking uh, biology, chemistry, and physics all in the same year. I wanted, you know, I, wanted to be, I wanted to be great. But it was a challenge socially, adjusting it was tough, you know, everybody was smart and it was a challenge. I, I just have a sneaky suspicion that even in a space like this, that there were young people, you all, you're looking at me right now, there's someone in this room, you may be hard, like how I was at that stage, struggling a bit to find yourself. Maybe it's identity issue, maybe it's just sort of just trying to fit in, find your way. You're around so many other people, and sometimes you wrestle with what makes me valuable. And that's where I found myself. I now forget. I enrolled in a Latin class. I need these Latin, right? It's dead Latin, right? In fact, I heard that's the only Latin thing you all have here. I asked them, they, they, they took everything else but Latin here, right? Taking a Latin class. And uh, we took O levels at this particular institution. I, that's no different system than the British system, but O levels, A levels, is a British system. Anybody know what O levels and A levels? Okay. So I attempted to take the, the Latin O level. And there's an attempt to take it. And uh, you know, I, 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 you know I, I, I took the O level, and the results came back. Now I have a PhD now, right? Everybody, you know. I'm a doctor of education, right? And I write prolifically in journals and you know speak and publish, right? Great. So you know I did really well with that level, right? What's <laughs> 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 the So I got a U on that new level. A U. You know, you know what a U stands for? Satisfactory. <laughs> no, 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 no. Unsatisfactory. That, 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 one, that, one, that doesn't describe it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it meant, you know, unbelievably great though. You meant unmarkable. Yeah. Unmarkable. And uh, I remember getting the sheet of paper. I remember walking in through school, carrying my saxophone on one hand, and walking this long walk that day. Real long walk. I remember meeting my mom, or her meeting me at the front, front door, the, the, the sliding glass door. 
And my mom asked about this about the test kit. I'm thinking, ah, well, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know that, you know how you start grunting and whatever, and you start to put it together. So she said to me, she asked me a question that changed the trajectory, uh, trajectory I believe, of my academic journey. She asked me a question. She said, she said, did you do your best? I thought, I can work with that question. <laughs> I did do my best. She hugged me and she said, well, that's good enough for me. That's a little different than what I expected. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting that to get a U or to not pass an exam is something that we aspire to work. <laughs> I'm not. But I am saying this. In that middle, I learned something. I learned that, that my value goes beyond a grade. And I have a sneaky suspicion that some of you in this room need to know that. You don't know that your value goes beyond a grade. You're not a transcript. You have value. I believe if Dr. King could talk to you, he would tell you that, that you, you have value. When he was talking about a dream, he wasn't just talking about the outcome of a class or your research. He was talking about your value that goes beyond anything that anyone can write down about you. Because the reality is that, listen, you're going to have moments, you're going to have times where you're not sure. You're going to have times where, where, where you question. And there are going to be people who question your dream. I had one of those individuals. I had a guidance counselor from that same school. And I had transitioned from high school now, and I was in college, and I had a, a plan to apply for various scholarships. And so I asked this high school guidance counselor if she'll write a recommendation for me. I needed two recommendations. I asked three people to write a recommendation now. That's a tip. I know you got great counselors here, so I'm, I'm sure they tell you that. I didn't use her letter, so I decided just to read it and see what she thought about it. And in the letter, I read these words, and it changed the trajectory of my life again. She said, Tyron Douglas is an average student with average academic ability. But that's not the stuff of scholarships, is it? <laughs> I'll be happy to report that I graduated from the university without debt, the recipient of many scholarships and awards. I don't share that to brag, but I share my experience to tell you that, listen, supposed academic ability is enough ability to get a PhD. Average academic ability, supposed average academic ability is enough ability to get a PhD. In other words, you're not average. There's nothing average about you. You're created with greatness, the greatness inside. You're not, there's nothing average about you. You're not some, just some mistake. You, you, there's greatness in you. And every single person, if they're human, they have moments where they question whether they have it or not. Even Dr. King. We put these folks up on pedestals and then we struggle to relate to, relate to them because we feel like, well, I, how can I do it? And, you know, I'm surrounded by so many great people and Dr. King must have struggled. He must have, oh, Dr. Torres, they, they, they never question. Well, let me tell you something as leaders. There are many moments where we question and we need people around us to support us. Ask me how I know. I'm a teacher. Ask me how I know. I know that because I've had my own experience, but I also know that because when I look at the life of Dr. King, I realize that he also had those same experiences. That speech that we talk about, the I have a dream speech, if you do some research, you will learn that he was up the night before questioning the content of that speech. He was unsure of what to include. And in fact, his speech advisor, his chief speech advisor, suggested to him, wait for it, that he leave out the I have a dream part. <laughs> the part that has become renowned for being his great oratorical contribution is the part that his speechwriter said, leave it out, Martin. You've said that too many times. We don't want to hear that anymore. They don't want to hear that anymore. We need something different. And so I want you to go back and look at the speech on your own time. If you'll notice that for the first seven minutes or so, Dr. King stands at the podium and he's reading. And it's, it's deep. I mean, the words are strong. I mean, that line about you know, uh, the governor's lips dripping, the words dripping with interposition and nullification, I love that. That just flows. That, I'm a linguist. I love that, right? But there was something different that happened, though, when he, when he, when he forsook his notes. He forsook his notes at about maybe the, the eight minute mark or so of the speech, and, and, and he grabbed his hands inside of the, of the podium like a Baptist preacher that he was. And it's 
interesting because you can't hear it on most of the recordings, but check this out. As he's get, getting to the end of what he's read, Mahalia Jackson from behind him shouts out, sings out, tell him about the dream, Mark. Tell him about the dream. And it's there that he has the courage to go into a portion of the speech where he speaks extemporaneously and he speaks from a place of authenticity, a place where you can't, you can't write that down. It's a place, it's a, something that he's seen, that he's experienced in his mind, but he knows it's going to be manifested physically. And he speaks with a passion and a courage and a, and a resolve that cannot be constructed or cannot be manufactured. It came from an honest place. It was his story. It was his dream. And so I said all that to say, I'm, I'm going to get out of your way, but I, I said all that to come by and ask you some questions. I want to ask you, what's your dream? Why are you here? Not just at IMSA, but why are you alive? You've lost friends, some of you. You should have been killed in a car accident, but you're still alive. Why are you here? What is that thing inside of you? There's something great inside of you. There's a reason why you're here. And I remember, you know, it's interesting, as I come to a conclusion, a conclusion, one of the most poignant lines when I look at the king's speech that he talks about the fierce urgency of now. The fierce urgency of now. And I believe that urgency still exists. We're living at in times that are, that, that are un un unstable times. This urgency of now, and people ask me all the time, why are you so passionate? Why are you so busy and engaged in work in, 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 in the academy and outside of it? Why are you so passionate about people? Why do you talk to young people the way you do? Why is it? And I said, because it's in me. I know what the first urgency of now means. And it's not from a dictionary. You see, before the PhD, before the doctor sermon, so and the credentials and the awards, before all of that, I was the embryo inside of a 19-year-old teenage mother who instead of coming home with a degree was going to come home with me. That's not what makes the story powerful. I can tell you that my mom, after I finished my master's, she's going back and finished her master's. I can tell you that that's powerful. I can tell you that after I finished my PhD, we're going to plan for her to come to, come to a zoo. And I'll be sitting on her committee and she'll get her PhD. Yeah, that's another powerful piece. But the part that really gets me at the foundation, here's the reality. She said that she found herself at a lonely abortion clinic in Huntsville, Alabama, thinking to do the unthinkable. And she said she caught a flutter in her stomach and knew she couldn't do it. I'm talking about the fierce urgency of now. There comes a time when you gotta move. There comes a time when you have to connect your, 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 your research with your research with your research, where, where, where you, the work that you're doing goes beyond a, 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 any institutional accolade or, or, or degree, and now it connects to the human condition. And I see those signs all over this building. That's a, that's a mantra that's consistent with the values here. I, I'm excited about that. There's an urgency that this world has. We need you. There's an urgency of now. But in order for you to be all that you're called to be, you gotta look at your story. You gotta look at your fears. You gotta look at your family. Some of you are you're here in school here, but you're alone from home, but home's still on your mind because you got a lot of stuff going on. I want to stand and encourage you and tell you that you are not a mistake. It's not a mistake that you're here. There's greatness inside of you no matter what the circumstances are of your life, no matter what the circumstances are of your birth. There's greatness inside of you. You're more than a flutter. You're a flutter that will one day be from a PhD that will speak to young people and tell them that they're great. You're more than, than, a, than a transcript. You are someone who will break cycles in your family. You are the dream. Dr. King, if he was here, I believe he would tell us that. He would, I believe he would tell us that, that you are a dream come true. That you're not a mistake. That you're not forgotten. That what you do matters, but even more fundamental than that, who you are matters. And so I challenge you. I don't just challenge you to dream. Dr. King did that. I challenge you to wake up. That's the only way that dreams get lived out. We can dream all we want, but it's not until we wake up. It's not until we begin to face our fears, to face the challenges, 
to face the reality is that racism is still a problem. Poverty is still a problem. When Dr. King was assassinated, he was there advocating for issues related to poverty. We're still uncomfortable talking about race. We're not yet there. We're not talking about it. It's a reality. We're divided. Look at our cafeterias. Look at our schools. Look at our relationships. Look at our churches. We're divided. We're not talking about this stuff. But don't just dream. I tell you, Dr. King did that. But he went to the mountaintop experience. That's his last speech. He came down and he talked about how he was no longer afraid. He said, I don't know what's going to happen to me. What going to get me? And so today, I challenge you to face your fears. I challenge you to climb the mountaintop. But then I challenge you to come down and to make the information, the resources, the privileges that we've had accessible to the people. That's what it means to be, to be a dream come true. That's what it means to be a dreamer, but more than that, that's what it means to wake up and to recognize that there's greatness in you. There's greatness upon you. I look forward to seeing where you end up. I know I'm going to see many of you doing great things, Pulitzer Prizes, Nobel Peace Prizes. If you look at Dr. King's resume, brother got a Nobel Peace Prize at 33. So I can talk about my accomplishments, but I'm behind. <laughs> but it's not about accomplishments. It's about purpose. It's about destiny. I don't know what you heard from this, but I hope that you would take something from this and use it to transform the world. The world needs you. Thank you for your time.